Okay, hi there. Welcome. Sunday lunchtime. Uh, we're thinking ahead to paper two on Monday. I know many of you got a busy exam week coming up with politics and geography and sociology and psychology, much else besides, and business as well. So this is a key week, isn't it, for half term, where we can all just take a little breather, uh, reset the uh, the buttons, re-energize, and get ready for the final papers after half term. So today we have three sessions, two back to back. I'm going to look at the UK economy in the next half an hour or so with you. And if it's okay with you, at 12.30, we'll do a session on global economy, development economics, that kind of stuff, really kind of key international stuff ahead of paper two. Five o'clock, we've got an open session just for 25, 30 minutes while I'll answer as many questions as I can. We're not making predictions. This is not a power video. It's not going to send you into the stratosphere. Our aim here, as always, for the Tutor 2 Student Collective is just to be encouraging, gently support each other, ask some interesting questions and uh, get some great answers just to, just to prime the the academic uh, oil into the, into the machinery as we head towards that paper tomorrow. If you want to contribute, please subscribe to the channel. It's super important. If you like what we're doing and uh, find it encouraging, press the like button. And uh, my producer, Jim, my stunt double, will flag up onto the screen some great answers along the way. And hopefully we have some new people here as well as our regular contributors. Hundreds of people now in the live chat, nearly 600 people. So we'll do our best to feature as many people as we can. Okay, folks, let's make a start uh, because time is on for the essence. Can I just, if it's okay with you, can I just spend a couple of minutes giving a kind of overview of where I think the macro is heading? This is not paper predictions. I just want to give you a sense of context because people, people often say these sessions are quite useful just for that little extra insight. Uh, crucially, the UK economy has experienced a whole series, of, a whole series of, of external shocks just in the last few years. We're thinking about the global financial crisis back in 2008, Brexit, obviously. Uh, I'm likely to get a specific question on Brexit, it's not on the spec, but the European Union clearly clearly is. The pandemic, obviously, the energy price shock last year, 
Uh, and now what I would suggest to you ahead of the exams, make sure today, please, you revise ADAS diagrams really well, output gaps, all that kind of stuff, because you'll be using ADAS as a kind of go-to analysis diagram for many questions, I think. Um, clearly, at the moment, the big issues are the slowing economy and high inflation. So the risk of stagflation, perhaps you might want to revise the Phillips curve diagram today to model this, particularly in a world where expectations of inflation are going up. There are also worrying signs, by the way, that inflation is becoming more persistent, not just in the UK, but in many other countries as well. And uh, perhaps policy inflation is, is now a little bit resistant to changes in interest rates. So we talked about a liquidity trap five or six years ago, where low interest rates wasn't really stimulating the economy. Perhaps this A star evaluation point could be that higher interest rates don't do much to control inflation, particularly if most of the inflation is, is both is external in origin. Lots of supply side issues facing the UK, low productivity, labour supply shortages, low investment. Keep, keep an eye out for uh, that. I did a video a little while back on why the UK economy is a low growth country. That might be worth checking out today. And two big issues, I think, could well be in the minds of examiners, the twin deficit issues. We've got a big fiscal deficit and we also have quite a big trade and current account deficit. Those are two big topics, I think, to cover today. So the UK faces uh, some difficult headwinds. Let's move on. Uh, key data. I'm not going to go through every line here. If you want to take a screenshot or a snapshot, uh, this is just the latest data. Inflation is 10.1%. The latest inflation figures come out on Tuesday. A bit late for us, isn't it? Uh, GDP growth probably flat this year, less than 1%, but we grew by 4% last year, 8% the year before, but of course we lost 11% of GDP in 20, 2020 during the pandemic. Interest rates are 4.5%. Unemployment is low, below 4% of the labour force, 3.9%, but of course look beneath the figures there, lots of inactivity, which we'll talk about in this session, high unemployment in certain regions, localities, etc. Wage growth is rising, but still lower than inflation. The yield on debt is uh, low, 3.4%, lower than it was in September. And the pound actually in recent months has been going up in value. It's now 125 against the dollar, set against the low during the Quateng budget of September of $1.07. Next slide, I think just groups together some other data. Big, big topics, fiscal policy, taxes, budget deficits. So last year, we had a budget deficit of over 5% of GDP. Uh, the national debt went above 2.2 trillion, which is about 100% of of our GDP. And crucially, I think, seriously, and we're going to look at this in a, in a, in a few set, few minutes, the tax burden is rising. So the overall burden of tax, direct and indirect taxes added together, is now forecast to rise to 38% of GDP by 2027. This is the highest in post-war period. And believe me, I've lived most of my life in the post-war period. <laughs> trade deficit, big, huge trade deficit in goods last year, nearly £5 billion a week. But we also had the biggest ever surplus in services. So maybe the UK trade could be a feature of this year's exam. Uh, our current account, not just trade, of course, um, primary and secondary income too, was rising to 4% of GDP. And we slipped five places on the competitiveness rankings in 2022. So we're now 23rd, according to the World Economic Forum. Our per capita income is about $46,000, GNI per capita. But the United States is well above I know that George Bulldog is our resident Irish expert in the in the group, and he will any question. The answer, by the way, is George says it's always Ireland. So it's a pretty good heuristic to follow. <laughs> Ireland's GNI per capita ninety thousand dollars. Well, what was that about? I mean, that is way way above the European Union average. You might think, well, why? Of course, it's a lot of the transfer pricing and profits flowing into Ireland to take advantage of high, uh, low low corporation tax. Keep in mind, by the way. You can go through this. We record this video. So if you want to go through it again, if you want the data for tomorrow, there it is. Right, let's crack on. I want to get our Shooter to student collective cracking on. Keep in mind interest rates. There we are. There's the path of interest rates. Um, the exam was set uh, spring of last year. Uh, might, have, might have upgraded it in the summer of 2022, by which time interest rates were rising, not just in the UK, but also around the world in many developed countries in particular. There we are, 4.5%. Uh, central bank interest rates. Okay, so here is my first question, I think, coming up. Can you please give me, in the chat window, uh, two negative effects of higher interest rates for businesses in the UK economy? Have a go.
Okay. Excellent answers. Toby had a terrific answer from the exchange. Here's Carl's answer. Lower confidence to invest. Animal spirits, Carl. Animal spirits. Higher cost of borrowing leads to decrease profit margins. Well, that's good. But there's Toby's answer. Cost of borrowing, therefore, the cost of production. Yeah, Toby, uh, interest rates, of course, is a fixed cost. That's mainly paper one. But, of course, it does increase the pressure on businesses. And it may well cause an inflow of hot money. So that uh, might cause the exchange rate to rise, which might have a damaging effect on exporters. Well done. Great points coming through there. Jacob said, well, what's corporation tax in the UK? Jacob, we've got a question on that coming up in just a few minutes. Here are my two answers. Uh, critically, uh, if interest rates go up, the cost of servicing debt goes up. A lot of companies, by the way, borrowed heavily during the pandemic. Uh, they issue corporate bonds, and of course, those bonds are now coming up for repayment. So it might lead to a fall in planned investment and, uh, and then develop the points. So if businesses spend less on investment, tooling equipment, whatever it is, that's going to affect businesses that produce the capital goods themselves. So you might want to bring in a, a negative multiplier effect on businesses that supply the investment goods. And I, I love the point. A lot of you are talking about the impact on consumption, an increase in the propensity to save, for example. So uh, falling consumer spending, possibly on interest sensitive products, products with a high interest elasticity of demand. And of course, there could be a fall in the housing market. Property prices, I think, have been falling recently. Uh, both of which would cause a fall in, in consumer uh, spending and a fall in business profits. Excellent. Now, a bit of evaluation coming up. Can you please give me two beneficial effects of higher interest rates for the economy? Hey, counter argument. Have a go. Wow, I love I love reading the the chat window, um, which we've slowed down a bit. I think there's so many people in the in the chat today. There's seventy people now with us live, because there's some great answers. You bang on it, everybody. There's some lovely answers coming through. I think Louis Robson had a terrific answer. I just wanted to wonder if we could find that one. Uh, Danny had a great answer about hot money increasing the incentive to save and, and savings flowing into banks, which was terrific. Here's Louis' answer: increased hot money flows strengthens the exchange rate. The UK is import dependent. Super point. Imported goods become cheaper, such as, but as such as seasoning there, oil, reducing the cost of production. production. Uh, oh, by the way, really important. If you get a question on exchange rates uh, tomorrow, use ADAS analysis to help build the analysis of the consequences. Because exchange rate changes have effects on both demand and also supply. Here are my two points. Uh, that Louis point chimes with mine. Uh, it might cause an appreciation of the exchange rate, which then makes imports such as components, energy, capital machinery less expensive. So that's a benefit to businesses, and it causes an outward shift of supply. And of course, the other point is that higher uh, higher interest rates, in theory, will lead to disinflation, bring inflation down from eleven percent down to ten. That might then help to moderate the, the inflationary pay pay. Um, um, Pay rises in the labour market. Uh, Freddie says, incentive to save so in future Jeff can get sandwiches cheaper. Well, as we know, I had this huge debate many times a few sessions ago about my favourite filling. Uh, we'll, be, we'll continue that later on as we get closer to lunchtime. Well done, everybody. Next move. Can you, uh, let's look at QT, quantitative tightening. I've just got one question for you on this. Uh, just in terms of knowledge, 
the peak of quantitative easing was 895 billion, 40% of GDP, if you're asking. They brought it down by about 80 billion already, about 10%. So they're now starting to reverse quantitative easing. Um, uh, and the, the government, the Bank of England, is just basically letting bonds mature and also selling some of the bonds they hold to the market, including commercial banks. Oh, now that's the question. Jeff, should, when should we use short and aggregate supply of a long supply? Okay, great question. That short and supply, SIS, basically shifts when there's a change in the short term cost of production. So things like energy prices, wages, uh, the cost of uh, imported raw materials, that kind of stuff. Okay. Whereas long run supply is driven more by factors such as productivity, investment, innovation, that kind of thing, labor migrate, long term labor migration. So a uh, good idea in revision today is to revise short run and long run aggregate supply for the uh, for the exam. So QT, here's my question, quantitative tightening. Um, Explain how quantitative tightening might affect banks in the UK. A little question on financial markets, which I'm thinking George and, and friends will be so pleased about. Have a go. Yeah, George making a point there about the fact that mortgage availability has, has certainly come down in recent times. It's pretty tough to get the mortgage these days. And Joshua and Romel both talking about bank liquidity, which is rather nice to see. Here's my answer coming up on the screen. Oh, there's Lionel Messi. Oh, Lionel's taken another break from his contract negotiations. There's a rumour, by the way, that Lionel Messi might be signing for Harrogate Town. It's just a rumour, that's what I'm saying. It was just the money supply can decrease liquidity and that can affect interest rates due to excess demand, etc. Yeah, oh, great points. Here are my answers coming up. Quantitative tightening, oh, that's, uh, yeah, can we go back? Can we go? Reduces the liquidity available in the financial system. Central bank sells assets. So basically, the central bank is selling bonds to, uh, to banks. Banks pay for them in cash. The banks get the bonds, but they have less cash. So there's less money the commercial banks can lend. And crucially, uh, interest rates tend to go up a little bit. Mortgage rates tend to go up which has, uh, oh, Johnny says, how does letting a bond mature decrease the money supply? Well, basically it just disappears. So it's no longer a deposit in the banking system. So therefore the money supply just goes down. When deposits disappear, they they just disappear. Uh, so quantitative sizing, don't worry too much about QT. Uh, you need to know about QE. Just be aware that the central bank is now just reversing uh, quantitative easing. A student in my lesson yesterday said, uh, QE, QT, so is the equivalent of nuclear decommissioning which I thought was a lovely answer. It's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take it, I was instead, they'll probably do it over three or four years. Okay, um, here we go. Oh, yeah, I love this one. Can you give me two reasons why higher interest rates might cause a trade-off with other macro objectives in the UK? Have a go, please.
Yeah, I like Jack's answer there. Uh, we know that only promised three point nine percent, but Jack is suggesting that if the Bank of England raises interest rates still further to let's say five percent, it could conflict with unemployment. Businesses struggling to repay debt might be looking to uh, to lay off staff. They have to control their costs somehow. It's a lovely point. A conflict there with possible unemployment objectives. Uh, and lots of you talking about slower growth, less spending in the economy, which is really good to see. Here are my answers. Uh, by the way, I just want to say a big thank you to everybody who's helping provide answers in the chat window. I can't reply to them all. And Jim in the production room in the, in, in the cellar is doing his best to pick out the great answers. So thank you if you're contributing by answering other people's questions. It is hugely appreciated. Slower growth and rising unemployment. I've cheated here. I've put the two, two objectives together that um, if you tighten monetary policy, you're likely to get slower growth and that could have a negative accelerator effect. I think I saw a couple of people mention that in the chat window. A planned investment might get hit if consumption falls. And crucially, of course, it costs the government money. The government has to spend interest on the debt. Did you know that this year the government's going to be spending £2 billion a week in interest on the debt? And, well, uh, that's an opportunity cost, clearly, uh, and uh, uh, increases the pressure for, as we know, tax increases or cuts in in spending. Uh, yeah, good points. Okay, Danny says, I hope you give Jim a summer break over the basement. Danny, don't, don't, don't give me ideas. Okay, next question coming up. Uh, let's focus now on fiscal. So we've done quite a bit on monetary policy. I think that's important. Let's spend some time on fiscal. I'm sure you're all revising fiscal. Eye watering some, 240 billion deficit last year, 5.5% of GDP. Uh, government debt is 100% of, of GDP. Crucially, of course, in 21 22, um, uh, the government was supporting households during the pandemic. And then the next year, they're having to support households through the energy price crisis. By the way, if you heard a, an alarm go off, that was just the ambulance going past my house. Nothing to be, nothing to be alarmed about. Here is, here's my question uh, Can you please give me two reasons why a large budget deficit might be problematic for the UK economy, for the UK government? Sorry. There we go. As Josh was answering up on the screen, looks pretty good to me about uh, um, low consumption, uh, high unemployment. Uh, it, you've got to think about the consequences for the government initially, and then you can lead on to other things. Lots of people talk about crowding out, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, Otto, I think, had a, Otto Smith had a great point there uh, about the impact on future generations of taxpayers. That is high level evaluation. Increase the national debt, which harms future generations that they have to pay increased tax rates in the future. That is really good if you're thinking about the intergenerational effects of government borrowing. Wow, that's staggeringly good. Here's my answers just to help. First of all, yeah, if the budget deficit is high, the national debt goes up. That could cause bond yields to go up. Um, a lot of people say if the, if the government spends more on in interest, there's an opportunity cost, which is true. But to get the higher analysis marks, you've then got to say, well, what is the opportunity cost? It could be, for example, there's less money to spend on social housing, less money to spend on early years education. There's less money to spend on infrastructure. If you give me just one example or two of what might be sacrificed, that gets you the marks. If you just say there's an opportunity cost, it's a bit like me saying the sun, sun's going to rise tomorrow. I mean, there will be an opportunity cost. So try to make it a little bit more detailed if you can under the pressure of the exam. And Ash says, such a seasoning. Well, it's nearly, I'm having a roast after my 12.30 session. Now. Ash, I will be adding a lot of seasoning. Uh, thank you for that inspiration. And the other big thing is inflation. So don't forget, as I say to my students yesterday, we, we, we carry on teaching at my school. Uh, don't, don't forget that uh, you can use a lot of year one, year 12 macro here. 
the government's injecting 150 billion pounds into the economy on the budget deficit side. That's adding to demand. So there could be a risk of inflation, particularly if the output gap is positive. Uh, and the high inflation we know has consequences for millions of people. I just want to make clear, by the way, that Jim is still with us. Now, that sound you heard, yeah, was a, it was a, an emergency alarm. It was not Jim having pressed the alarm to get out of the, out of the, um, the cellar. He's still there. Okay, moving on. Here we go. Next question coming up. Oh, yeah, I love this one. Can you give me, and here we go. This is going to test your evaluation skills. Can you please give me two justifications for the UK government running a large fiscal deficit? Let's go. <laughs> yeah maybe we should mix up the music a bit i, I love this tune by the way and my students tell me they're actually singing it during the exam actually out loud which causes problems occasionally uh yeah tommy talks about automatic stabilizers, which is superb henry talks about the need to inject money into the nhs to aid the backlogs of waiting times henry that is a brilliant answer by the way because it links to economic inactivity and labor shortages and uh, the lagged effects of the pandemic uh, started to really show through on the, on the, the supply side of the economy. Uh, absolutely brilliant. Lots of good answers coming through. People mentioning laughter curves, that kind of stuff. Um, here's, uh, I just thought I'd unleash my inner Keynesian point that the government allowed the automatic stabilizers to work during the recession. That's why the budget deficit went up. And without the furlough scheme, 70 billion pounds, 11 million people, on furlough over the course of the pandemic, not all at once, where would unemployment have been had they not introduced the furlough? Critically, can I introduce a, um, a comment, a, a concept here? Counter cyclical fiscal policy. So if the economy goes into the downswing, fiscal policy is expansion into trying to stabilize the cycle. Uh, Rosati says, Jeff is a Keynesian economist, confirmed. Rosati, you are so right. I did my economics at Cambridge. Uh, I was taught by Keynesian economists, including. Uh, just before she passed away, sadly, the late, great Joan Robinson. Unbelievable times. What a great university. Uh, and then the war broke out. So aggregate supply and poverty reduction is quite important. So again, uh, application here. You can justify a deficit if you're buying to invest. Great point. But buying to invest what? Green energy, transport infrastructure, social housing, etc. So you can make a case for saying that budget deficits uh, the consequences of budget deficits depend on what's causing them and how the borrowed money is used. Leroy says, Jeff, thoughts on Luton Town being promoted? Well, they haven't yet won the final, but if they do, it'll be a quite incredible achievement, particularly as they were in the non-league just a few years back. Absolutely amazing. I didn't teach Keynes. Uh, well, I taught him a little bit. He moved on by that point. Okay, here we go. Uh, let's crack on. The conscience of time. 60 second job. This could well come up. Have a go. What's meant by crowding out? What do we think?
Then James's point, the government uses liquidity that could be in the private sector. Stifling efficiency and allocation of resources. A nice little micro point there. And Robbie, Robbie Thompson has a nice point there, I think, about uh, if we can find Robbie's, Robbie's answer. It might come up on the screen. One of our ACE contributors. An unbalanced economy where government spending overwhelms the private sector. Wow, that's interesting. Fascinating point. Unbalanced economy. Uh, and there's a whole debate is about the size and scope of the state. Here's my, my pathetic attempt at an answer. Crowding out can happen when there's an increase in government borrowing. That causes the demand for loanable funds to go up, which then causes market interest rates to rise. That can then squeeze out investment by the private sector. Well, ultimately, of course, if the government borrows more, it will have to tax more. And if taxes go up, household disposable, income, disposable incomes fall and um, tax, taxable profits of businesses go up and therefore companies make less profit. Here we go. Next question. Evaluation. Evaluation. This is a tough question. Uh, anybody gets this right is has my eternal admiration. Why might crowding out be unlikely, even if the fiscal deficit is high and the national debt is rising? Here we go. Well, this was a hard question, and the answers are staggeringly good. I mean, uh, extraordinary answers. Uh, Madison had a great answer. Will Stubbs had an absolutely fantastic answer about, uh, I think, both of them reflecting that the UK is part of an open world economy. We can attract learnable funds from overseas. And the Bank of England, of course, with QE, is buying a lot of government debt. So the, the old-fashioned ideas of crowding out are not necessarily uh, relevant today. You have to explain it, but there's the evaluation. You can challenge it. Here's Will's answer. Crowding in may actually occur. The increased government investment incentivizes private firms to do the same, particularly, Will, if the government's spending money on transport infrastructure, for example. Construction companies have to invest themselves to be able to uh, win and meet the contracts and deliver the, uh, the projects. Antonio says it depends on where the government is spending. Brings in external economy of scale. It can cause crowding in as it stimulates private sector investment. If I was producing answers like this the day before the exam, I'd be in a good place. Really well. Now, quite a few of you say that you're going to Dolls, um, uh, for want of a better word, live stream tonight. Good luck with that. Hope it goes well. I just like the way we do things here because we're encouraging you to contribute. And, and the answers are absolutely amazing. So uh, can I add in some points? If it's OK, can I add in some points? If you, if you grow the economy through expansion of fiscal policy, it's a positive multiplier effect. So in fact, it could be self-financing. Uh, the Bank of England might buy government bonds as part of QE. And critically, critically, uh, the UK has access to global capital markets, and we are pretty attractive to those foreign savings into our commercial banks, which does make it easier for the government to borrow without interest rates necessarily having to go up. Keep in mind, the yield on 10-year debt in the UK is 3.6%. Uh, I'm not going to throw shade at, at, our, at our great uh, fellow economics YouTubers. They're brilliant at what they do, and we're okay at what we do, but we just love supporting you as you head towards your papers. Almost there. Let's try a couple more uh, thoughts. Oh, yeah, this is super important. Uh, I think uh, Jacob asked about corporation tax 20 minutes ago. This is, I think, a key change. I hope everybody's aware of it and we'll ask a question. Here we go. Uh, corporation tax. So if you just go back a slide, Jim, on the, just the context. Corporation tax is a tax on profits, so it's not a cost of production. Anyway, it's another issue. <laughs> Raises a lot of money, £74 billion, pounds, fourth biggest tax. Now, uh, 2021, they announced it was going to go up from 19 to 25%. Then Quartan came in and said, no, it's not going to happen. And then he didn't last very long. <laughs> so Jeremy Hunt said, no, it is going to happen. So on the 1st of April, 
corporation tax went up from 19 to 25 percent, but only for big businesses, big businesses that make a profit of over a quarter of a million pounds. For smaller firms, um, it's still 19 percent and it goes up gradually between 50 and 50k and 250,000 in profits. Is that okay this context? Just be aware of that as you go into the exam. Here's my question for the team. Examine, can you give me one argument for and one argument against this rise in corporation tax from 19 to 25%? Have a go. Yeah, here we go. Some great points. Jake talks about uh, you need to need to tax, you need to, re- you need to reduce the revenue uh, to increase government spending against the Laffer curve. I think a lot of people would be probably using the Laffer curve so that raising tax doesn't necessarily increase your tax revenue. That's fine. Laffer curve is okay. Uh, do check out, by the way, my video on the Laffer curve and how, how possibly you might want to draw it, especially the usual funny shape. Uh, well, just the usual big shape, <laughs> the usual one. Uh, his Chris's answer may cause large firms to move elsewhere to save on tax, therefore increasing unemployment. Focus the tax on those making super low profit instead of struggling firms or people. Wow, good evaluation there. Uh, some great answers coming through as always. And uh, keep an eye on the chat window if you want some the views of your fellow students. Yeah, a couple of points if it's okay with you. One is that profits in the UK have been going up, actually. A lot of companies benefited from the furlough uh, and made quite high profits, actually, during the pandemic. Um, and there's some evidence by the profit push inflation where firms have been raising prices above cost, getting away with it. Look, if you haven't been able to raise your price for 10 years, maybe now is the time to try and raise your price. OK, so that you can make a case for saying it's progressive, it's equitable for bigger companies, more profitable businesses to pay higher taxes and help bring down the deficit. Uh, on the other hand, uh, 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 the crit- critical point, that's a big rise, isn't it? From 19 to 25 percent, that is a big jump and it might Hedging word might make the UK less attractive for FDI in a post-Brexit nirvana, leading to a decline in jobs, potential capital flight. I think, yes, Holly made the point about capital flight, which I thought was terrific. And critically, a higher rate might lead to an increase in tax avoidance, such as the use of transfer pricing by multinational. Do check out our little video on transfer pricing. It's a technical part of the edXL course in particular that's worth Revising. Lucas says, what's your favourite song? Well, I've got all the Harrogate Town chants, Lucas, and I, but I won't try them this lunchtime. I think we have a couple of Grimsby Town fans, by the way. I just want to say thank you for the three points you gave us on Boxing Day. That proves a very welcome Christmas present. Well, I've got one more topic to go with you. Bear with me. This again, key one, unemployment. Now, everybody's expecting a question on unemployment, OK? It's low, it's 3.9%. It may well go up this year. I'm going to focus on... Uh, economic inactivity. One person in five of working age is inactive, inactive. And the government's concerned that high levels of inactivity is holding back growth and recovery from the pandemic. Um, (laughs) Sam says, do I always fight the away fans? Well, yes. Um, And of course, next year, I'll be able to go home and away. So I'll be able to visit some of the iconic grounds in in world football. Uh, Here we go. So here's my question. Nearly a thousand people in the live chat. Can you give me two policies? Now, I want it to be as specific as possible, please, on this one that might help to lower economic inactivity in the UK. Have a go to finish off with.
Mm. See, Aaron's points there. Uh, I love those points. And, and there's lots of others, Nick and uh, Jonathan and Rachel have some fantastic points coming through there. Aaron, increase in funding for apprenticeship schemes, lower bands of income tax, lower welfare payments, incentivized work. These are all good. Uh, and uh, again, just the more specific you can make it, the better in the exam. Avoid generalities, try to make it specific and you'll get the extra depth of analysis. It also helps you to evaluate. Uh, RT11 skills, appropriate name for somebody on economic inactivity. Talks about lower transfer payments, such as job seeker allowance, increased minimum wage, uh, government spending towards NHS and education, improving transferable skills. Yeah, excellent. A lot of people have some great uh, context here about the scale of uh, inactivity. There's been an increase of 500,000 people who've, sorry, 500,000 people have left the labour market since the pandemic, many of whom are sort of my kind of age. And I'll leave you to guess what kind of age I am. So I think the key thing really is to, in, is to improve uh, financial incentives, a little, script, a little glitch there, to make work pay, uh, things like supply side policies, tax free childcare, minimum wage, for example, transport costs, making rented housing more affordable, and also those detailed labour market policies. Uh, so, for example, T-levels, STEM education, degree apprenticeships, and also encouraging uh, employers to offer more part-time work, job sharing, remote work options. They can all help. And the ages are coming through. I think most people are getting right. The median age on the people who have come through is about 30. So I think you're pretty close, actually. Patrice says I'm 82. That is a little off, Patrice. You're at least five years out. Okay, uh, well done on that, everybody. Final slide. I'm not going to suggest what topics are going to come up. That's for others to do in their glory. Please make sure today you've covered ADAS in detail. That's your, that's your go-to theory for most of the UK macro. And you'll get good marks by just using ADAS. If I'm asking UK, I think trade and balance of payments is a big topic. We talked a lot today about fiscal and monetary policy. And maybe just something on the European Union. Uh, single market and single currency. Brexit won't appear because it's not specific on the syllabus, but they can ask questions about the European Union. Uh, and that could be a, a, a handy thing to revise this afternoon. Now, we're going to take a break for 20 minutes or so and come back and do a little 30-minute session on international economics. We've got some terrific questions on development for you and exchange rates. So if you fancy a break and then a little pre-lunch international... Uh, um, <laughs> international session please do join us asma says all you can hear is the music in the exam georgia says jim is a classical economist so that's why he's locked in the basement that's true but i just don't like near classical economists i always use a keynesian curve and george says if i get an a star will you release jim well george if you get the a star i think you're going somewhere pretty special for your degree so i think the answer is yes msd jim pin this <laughs> if you need help and Ben says, Jeff, do you think that Kane will go to Harrogate Town this summer? I think he'll probably pass by. He might go to Betty's. He probably won't end up at the Environment Stadium. I have been invited, by the way, by a member of the collective to watch Harrogate play Grimsby Town away next year. And I'm happy to accept it. One of my great friends is a comedian who watches Swindon Town. And uh, he, get, he goes there to, to basically pick up the more, some new jokes, which is what regularly happens at the county ground. Freddie says, are you from Harrogate, Jeff? I think we might well have worked it out for that I am indeed a Harrogate Town fan and an ultra. I'm going to enjoy my sandwich. Hopefully you can join me again in 15 minutes or so for international economics. Take care, stay safe, stay curious. See you sometime soon. <laughs>